Noble Review, Macroeconomics and Microeconomics, for use with introductory college macro and micro courses, as well as the AP macro and micro exams. In this podcast, we'll go over the top 10 concepts that you need to know unit by unit. Noble 4, Banking and Monetary Policy, Macro. Number 1. What is money? Money should contain several qualities for it to be efficient for an economy. For example, money should be accepted, convenient, portable, and divisible. Here is a list of the three key functions of money. 1. A medium of exchange. It buys you things. 2. Stores value. It holds its worth over time. 3. Standard of value. It is a measuring tool of wealth. Modern economies use fiat money, which means that the money has no intrinsic value. In other words, it is money because the government says so. Fiat money is not backed by gold or silver. It is backed by our faith in the government and monetary system. Number two, how do we define the money supply? The money supply, or money stock, is monitored and controlled by the central bank, known as the Federal Reserve in the United States. There are three basic definitions of the money supply. One, M1 consists of currency, coin, checkable deposits, also known as demand deposits, and traveler's checks. Two, M2 consists of M1 plus savings deposits and small-time deposits, or any savings instrument that is less than $100,000. M3 consists of M2 plus large-time deposits that are greater than $100,000 and institutional money market accounts. Number three, how does a bank's balance sheet work? A bank's balance sheet, or T account, lists the assets, what it owns, and liabilities, what it owes, of the institution. The two sides of the balance sheet must equal each other after a transaction is made. In this sample balance sheet, $20,000 was deposited into checking accounts. These demand deposits are liabilities since the bank must pay depositors this money on demand. The bank stores the deposits in reserve accounts, which are recorded as assets. Banks must keep a percentage of the demand deposits as required reserves. The central bank sets the reserve requirement. On this balance sheet, the reserve requirement is 15% because $3,000 is 15% of $20,000. This bank can hold the other $17,000 as excess reserves, which is important because a bank creates money when it lends from excess reserves. This bank already lent out $12,000. Presently, it can legally lend an additional $5,000 from excess reserves. If a bank cannot meet its reserve requirement, it can borrow from another bank at the federal fund's interest rate, or from the Federal Reserve at the discount rate. Number four, what is the relationship between interest rates and spending? There is an inverse relationship between interest rates and private spending. When interest rates are low, Businesses and households have more incentive to borrow from banks. More borrowing leads to more investment spending and consumer spending. These ideas are also reflected in the money market by the money demand curve. As the nominal interest rate falls, there is a greater quantity of money demanded by the private sector. When the interest rate is low, the opportunity cost of holding money is low. Please note that the money supply curve is vertical because it is set by the central bank. As interest rates increase, 
businesses and households have less incentive to borrow from banks. Less borrowing leads to less investment spending and consumer spending. When interest rates are high, the opportunity cost of holding money is high. There is more incentive to save rather than to spend. Number five, what is monetary policy? The Federal Reserve is the central bank of the U.S. It has several tools of monetary policy that influences money supply and interest rates. Here are the major monetary policy tools. One, open market operations. When the Fed buys or sells government bonds or securities to change the money supply and interest rates, the Fed targets the federal funds rate. This is the bank-to-bank -bank interest rate for short-term loans, and this happens through open market operations. If the Fed wants to increase money supply and reduce interest rates, then it buys bonds. If the Fed wants to reduce the money supply and increase interest rates, then it sells bonds. 2. Discount rate. The Fed can increase or decrease the interest rate it charges banks for short-term loans. When the Fed lowers the discount rate, the money supply increases. When it raises the discount rate, the money supply decreases. 3. Reserve requirement. The Fed can reduce the reserve ratio, which means banks can lend more of its excess reserves to increase the money supply. It can also raise the reserve ratio, which reduces a bank's excess reserves and the money supply. Number six, how does an expansionary monetary policy work in the short run? An expansionary or easy monetary policy makes most sense during a recession. The Fed will buy bonds on the open market. It can also decrease the discount rate or decrease the reserve ratio. In the money market, this is represented by a rightward shift of the vertical money supply curve. This will reduce nominal interest rates and cause an increase in investment and consumer spending. As a result of the increases in investment and consumption, aggregate demand will shift to the right. Real GDP will increase, price level will increase, and unemployment will decrease. Number seven, how does a contractionary monetary policy work in the short run? A contractionary or tight monetary policy makes most sense during periods of high inflation. The Fed will sell bonds on the open market. It can also increase the discount rate or increase the reserve ratio. In the money market, this is represented by a leftward shift of the vertical money supply curve. This will raise interest rates and decrease in investment and consumer spending. As a result of the decrease in investment and consumer spending, aggregate demand will shift to the left. Real GDP will decrease, price level will decrease, and unemployment will increase. Number eight, what is the relationship between interest rates and bond prices? Interest rates and bond prices have an inverse relationship. When interest rates are low, money is cheap and the opportunity cost of holding money is low. People can afford to put their money into bonds. An increase in demand for bonds leads to higher bond prices. As interest rates rise, money is expensive and people cannot afford to hold on to as many bonds. This pushes bond prices down. Number nine, what is the money multiplier? When money is deposited into a bank, excess reserves rise, which increases the lending capability of the bank and the entire banking system. This is because new loans create new checkable deposits, which then create new loans in another bank and then new checkable deposits, and so on. The money multiplier, also known as the deposit expansion multiplier, is calculated using the reserve ratio set by the central bank. Money multiplier equals 1 divided by the reserve ratio. As the reserve ratio falls, 
the money creating potential of the banking system increases. As the reserve ratio rises, the money creating potential of the banking system decreases. Number 10. How do you use the money multiplier? Here are formulas to estimate how much the money supply can potentially increase when banks lend out all excess reserves. These first two formulas are based on an initial demand deposit into a bank. A change in money supply from a demand deposit equals excess reserves of the initial deposit times the money multiplier. The change in demand deposits in the banking system equals the initial deposit times the multiplier. These next two formulas are useful for monetary policy. A change in money supply from open market operations equals the bond purchase or sale by the Fed times the money multiplier. Change in new loans from the open market operation equals the excess reserves of the initial bond purchase times the money multiplier. Bonus! How do you determine the present value and future value of money? Let's assume that you receive $10 today, the present, and the interest rate on your savings account is 5%, and you want to determine the value of that $10 in one year, which is the future. You would use the following formula to determine the future value of money. Future value equals the present value times 1 plus the interest rate to however many years you are looking to uh, calculate. In one year, that $10 will be worth $10.50. That's 1050 equals 10 times 1 plus 0 0.05 to the first power. Now let's assume that you will receive $10 in one year and want to determine the present value of that $10 you will receive in the future. Here is the equation for the present value of money. Present value equals future value divided by 1 plus the interest rate to a, however many years you are looking to calculate. The present value of that $10 in the future is $9.52. That's 9.52 equals $10 divided by 1 plus 0 0.05 to the first power. The time value of money formulas used above show that you are better off receiving a dollar today than in the future because the dollar today can earn interest. Interest represents the opportunity cost of holding money, so don't keep all of your hard-earned cash in the sock drawer. That wraps up this episode of Noble Review's Top 10 Economic Concepts. Now for extra study resources, please visit my website at mrmedico.info. Thanks for choosing to learn with the Noble Review. Till next time.